welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's video, we will be taking a look at a live transferable Browning 1919 A6 belt fed machine gun. This is chambered in 30 6 just as the originals were. Now we are going to start off with some range footage and then I'm going to come back and uh, we will get into a tabletop overview of this and sort of explain what the 1919 A6 is. There really isn't a whole lot about these on the internet. They don't really get a lot of attention as much as the 1919 A4, which is the variant that most people are familiar with. So we will go through a little bit of a history, talk about the changes that were made from the A4 to the A6 and sort of show you operationally how this thing functions and break it down and all that fun stuff. So anyway, if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around, that's coming up now. Okay, so it's really hard to fit this whole thing in frame and get in here with it. So I know my head's cut out of frame here, but the focus is really on the firearm anyway. So most people are familiar with the 1919 A4. So the 1919 A4 looked very similar to this, except there was no type of shoulder stock or bipod, and the booster at the front looked a little bit different. Essentially, other than, other than those differences, that's what the 1919 A4 looked like. And you would attach it with a pintle right up here at the front, and you would have your little T&E that the back would rest on, and it would sit on a tripod. And typically, to operate the machine gun or employ it, you would have one person carry the machine gun, you would have two people carry ammo, and one person would have to carry the tripod. Now, the machine gun tactics of the 1919 A4 were similar to the 1917 and 1917 A1, where it did serve more in a heavy machine gun role. When you got to the 1919 A4 air-cooled, it was more of a medium machine gun, but it was still very heavy and did require a lot of, uh, basically, a lot of personnel to get the thing up and running. Well, as World War II was progressing, the United States realized and paid attention to other countries such as Japan with the Type 99 and Type 96, and actually even the Type 11 machine guns, light machine guns, Britain with the Bren, Russia had a DP-28, and of course there was, uh, there was Germany with the general purpose machine guns, the MG34 and MG42. Now the one thing that all of those machine guns had in common is it was basically the firearm could be carried by one person and typically you had one or two other people carrying ammunition. But to get the firearm up and active and uh, maneuverable and that sort of thing, it was a lot easier in the light machine gun role as opposed to a medium or a heavy machine gun. Most specifically when we're talking about offensive movement. So, of course, the United States and both the European and Pacific theater spent most of the war in offensive roles. So getting into something that was a little bit more maneuverable and easier to get into, uh, into a fighting scenario was very optimal and something that we definitely needed. Now, at the time in the United States, we had the BAR, and a lot of people look at the BAR as a light machine gun option when it really isn't. That's more of an automatic rifle. It was really a force multiplier, but was never really meant to provide the sustained fire that the 1919 A4 or an MG34 or an MG42 is able to produce. So as a stopgap, 
the United States came up with the idea to modify the 1919 A4 into a medium, or I'm sorry, into a general purpose or a light machine gun roll. Now they did that by basically doing the obvious things that you see here. They added a carry handle, and now I have a little bracket here, the wooden carry handle I have, but I took it off and forgot to bring it with me uh, because the case I carry it in is not really the best for this firearm. Uh, so the thing would rattle around and I didn't want it to break, but you would have a wooden handle here to carry. You had a bipod, a muzzle cone or a flash hider, and then a stock. And this is all, basically these are bolt-on parts. And then of course they lightened up the profile of the barrel, which I will show you in a minute. Now this is far from lightweight. This is still in at about between 32 and 35 pounds, which honestly isn't that much heavier than an MG34. The MG34 weighs somewhere between about 28 to 30 pounds. So we are only talking a couple pounds heavier than an MG34. Now I have had an MG34 and I've done videos with it and I can attest there are some definite advantages in the MG34. It's a more thought out design machine gun. This is again a stop gap. Now this would go into service in late 1943. So at the time the United States Ordnance Department realized it needed something in more of a general purpose or light machine gun role. You have to realize development for a whole new weapon system takes years. So we are hot and heavy in the middle of World War II. There was no time for that. So we had to modify something and I'm saying we because I'm American. But the Ordnance Department had to modify something that existed and get it into service. Now the BAR again was not optimal because it did fire from 20 round magazines. It did not have a quick change barrel. So it cannot lay down the suppressive fire that was needed in something like a 1919A4 or a 1919A6. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these modifications. So the one obvious one is the stock. This is basically just a stamped sheet metal stock and there's a little wing nut here, which if I'm gonna get the stock off, you just twist it, it unlocks, and then this piece just hinges down out of the way. And then, and keep in mind, this is pretty heavy, so you just kind of pull this off here. There we go. And as you can see, this is just a tube, and then it slides over the back of the pistol grip here. And then once it's on, this wing that kind of slides over into this channel and then you turn to tighten it down. And that's all there is to it. Very, very simple modification. Okay, the next modification would of course be the carry handle. And again, this is just another bolt-on part. So this would have to slide over the front of the barrel jacket and then you would clamp and tighten it down with a screw and a, a, a or a, what am I trying to say, a, a jam nut or something like that back here. Um, and then it just tightens on. You can set it anywhere along the, uh, the barrel shroud that you want to. It does pivot to either side. Of course, again, you would have a wooden handle uh, screwed in through that little hole here. Uh, again, I have that, but I've taken it off. They're inexpensive. If you want this whole setup, I mean, they're like $80. Again, you can modify and put this on your 1919A4. All of these are just clamp on parts. Now on the front end here, there's been a couple modifications. So they did modify the barrel jacket from a 1919A4 for the booster and the blast cone. So now in order to get that off, you just have a little lever which you just pull. And this is actually just a spring loaded clamp. That's all that is. And that goes around that flash hider cone and then locks in like that. Now there are two recesses here two slits cut into the side where the little spring kind of sits in there and then two additional grooves right here and that just basically fixes it in place now you are going to get a little bit of wob wobble and movement when that's attached but it's not really a big deal now a lot of people would say well why didn't they just make it threaded well this is kind of one other ingenious thing so most people know that when it comes to a light or a medium machine gun or a general purpose machine gun barrel changes are essential now I'll show you this in disassembly, but on the 1919A4, the barrel, the barrel extension, the lock frame, and the bolt are, well, not really the bolt, but the barrel, barrel extension, and the lock frame are all attached inside the receiver. And in order to get the barrel out, you have to take off the back plate. Again, I'll show you this in a minute. Take out every single part from the back of the gun. In fact, the last thing to come out is the barrel. You have to remove the barrel from the lock frame screw the arm from the barrel extension, screw the barrel back into the barrel extension. You have to set your headspace and then you're back in action. Essentially, that means there is no in the field quick change barrel system. It's a process that would take a trained person. One or two people would probably take five minutes at, at the very least for people who know what they're doing. 
as opposed to an MG34 or an MG42 or a Bren or a Type 96, which barrel changes can be done in less than 20 seconds. Now in the 1919 A6, there was a modification to that. And what you will see is there are two flats. There's one here and there's one here. And you would have an armorer's wrench and the gunner could actually put the wrench around those flats and turn and unthread it from the barrel extension from the front. And then they could bring the barrel out the front and then put in a replacement barrel and ratchet it back down into the barrel extension. So it was still not fast. Again, you needed a tool, you needed to, to take this off. You needed to get the wrench around the barrel, get it off, pull it out, put it back in, and you still have to headspace it. So maybe it went from a five minute operation to a two and a half minute operation. So still not something that was a quick and easy done process in the field. Now, one other thing they added was this bipod. The bipod is very similar to that that you will find on the BAR. It is probably the worst bipod design of the Second World War, probably even the First World War. But anyway, you have two sets of wing nuts on either side. The top one basically unlocks it from this little channel here and it can pivot back, that's how you stow it. The second set of wing nuts here adjusts your length of elevation on the bipod legs. Each one has to be done individually and there are no notches to show you your distance or how you are setting it. So for example, when I went out to the range, I would have to loosen both, try and balance the gun and get it as level as possible, then tighten them back down. And still, I would notice the firearm a little bit off center. And again, if you're have a, a bump or something in the dirt and you're using that and you're gauging your distance and then you move the gun you're going to be off balance again so anyway the other other machine guns from the era are a lot better this is a really clumsy design and essentially the gunner would have to know and set the bipod length uh, and even deploy and have the bipod legs out and ready to go before even entering engagement so they were on a patrol or anything like that, the bipod legs would typically be extended, making it even more cum cumbersome. Now, the bipod legs also rotate a full 360 degrees, which is a little bit awkward as well. But again, they just had the booster extension here. You would just put that over there. You put on a little lock ring to keep it in place. And then, you know, it was just a quick modification, but still an awful bipod. Now, general operation of the machine gun, you have a latch right here, which you pull back, and that will allow you to lift your top cover. Now, this is a trunnion protector. These were not typically issued. This is sort of a new device that's been made by people, but it's just a little piece of stamped sheet metal. That's to protect your trunnion if you are shooting with uh, disintegrating metal links, because if you don't have that, it will wear and scrape up your trunnion. So if you have a semi or fully automatic 1919 and you want to use metallic disintegrating links, make sure you pick up a trunnion protector there. Now inside here, this right here is your extractor. You basically load in your ammunition and the extractor goes right over your first round. Here on the top of the bolt, you will see a track that goes with a corresponding, there's a little notch here. And as the bolt reciprocates, it causes this arm to move, which engages your feed arm or your feed pawl, which grabs rounds and brings them into battery. The MG34 and the M60 both work in a very similar way. Now what happens, it is a closed bolt machine gun. So what happens is the bolt is closed. The extractor is over your first round. When the bolt or when the firearm fires, the bolt will travel back. You'll see the extractor here just dropped. It goes down into a channel because it now has your round and it pushes it into the chamber, which is right below the feedway. It chambers the round and then you will, you, you will see the extractor go back up in alignment, up over the top and snag another round. So the, whole, the way I kind of look at this is it's a kind of a multi-layered machine gun kind of a two-story machine gun, if you will. So you have the, the upper floor, which is where you're feeding, and the bottom floor, which is where you're firing. So not as linear as, you know, some other things. But anyway, very, very interesting how that functions. Now keep in mind, it does requ require unlocking. So the booster at, at the front, the little booster cone, does trap gases and reverts back on the barrel, which pushes it to the rear slightly, allowing it to start unlocking and then the bolt travels the rest of the way. Okay, now I will show you disassembly. So you will need a screwdriver, a flathead screwdriver to help you with this in a couple ways. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get the spring tension off of the bolt. So you bring the bolt all the way to the rear and hold it in place. Then with the screwdriver, you can see the back of the guide rod. Push that in, 
turn it, and it'll lock in place. Now, now that that's turned and locked, the bolt is no longer under spring tension. As, as you can see, I can move it back and forth. So I'm going to move the bolt all the way forward, lock it back into the barrel. That's okay. So now up here, this latch, which served to open the top cover, if you push it in the opposite direction, it unlocks the back plate here that has your uh, pistol grip and everything on it. So typically you need a tool to help you with this as well. So I'm going to use a screwdriver, just kind of jam it in here against the rear sight base and push. As you can see, it starts releasing that from the back. Now from there, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the bolt back again and align the charging handle with the corresponding notch here on the side of the receiver and pull out the charging handle. Now with that out, I can go ahead and pull the bolt out the rear. And that is the bolt assembly. And keep in mind, the mainspring is captive right in here. You do not want to release that because this is under a tremendous amount of spring tension. There are ways to remove it, but I'm not going to do that for this disassembly. As you can see, there is the extractor, which pivots up and down and the bolt face down here. And of course I've shot this, so this thing is filthy. Now from there, the next thing you will do is you take the charging handle. There is a little corresponding hole here with a spring loaded little pin that's locked into the side of the receiver. That is holding your lock frame in place here. So I'm gonna go ahead and push on that. And then with that depressed, the lock frame and everything can start moving and everything in here is incredibly tight. I'm gonna push from the front of the barrel, can start moving forward. Now that I moved it enough, it's, it's released so I can start pushing it the rest of the way. And all of your internal components are all locked together right now. So there's a lot of, so as you can see, everything's coming out. You see where that barrel is. And as I'm pulling this out, I know I'm going off frame. And that is disassembled. So I will set the receiver and everything aside and show you sort of the internal components. Okay, so this here is your lock frame. It has your trigger group on it. And it is locked into the back of the barrel extension here and then here is your barrel. So on a 1919 A4, you have to take all of this out the back, and then you can push on your accelerator, remove the lock frame from the barrel extension, then you can unthread your barrel from the barrel extension, and then all those parts are disassembled. Now on a 1919 A4, you would then take your new barrel, thread it back into the barrel extension, reattach the lock frame to the back of that, Put everything back inside the firearm and then when all of that's done you would have to time or i'm sorry you would have to headspace it which i'll show you when i get everything back together now as you can see this is the smaller profile 1919 a6 barrel it is much smaller and much lighter than the 1919 a4 now the front up here does have to be thicker to sort of sit inside the booster keeps your barrel in alignment and then of course right up here at the front those are those wrench flats i showed you and gas is push on this which allows it to, to shortly short recoil inside the barrel jacket and unlock the extension from the trunnion. Now up here in the barrel extension, there is a little channel. You see these little channels in here. There are corresponding grooves in the bolt. So those grooves actually sit in the barrel extension like that and reciprocates. Now as you, and the extractor is a free floating piece that just comes out, it's not a big deal. So as this reciprocates, actually what it'll do is it'll unlock your accelerator on the lock frame and the trigger from here actually sits inside this channel right here and engages your sear. Now the bolt and everything is, or the firing pin is actually inside the bolt carrier obviously. So this would reciprocate in that little track. Now that's basically how that functions. Now as you can see the extractor here, when it's in battery, the extractor will be here and it does ride inside of a cam inside the receiver. But when it unlocks and starts moving back, you see how the extractor drops. It would have a round and it brings it into the chamber, which would be here. It rides up on a cam, going to pick up another round. That's basically how that works. Okay, now I'm going to show you reassembly. And what we will do is start with locking the lock frame to the back of the barrel extension. This is your accelerator here, which I will lock around this tail 
like that. And then these two arms, it's a little bit tricky, go inside these little recesses here and you just push and then pull the accelerator back down and that is locked back together. Now I'm going to take my barrel and thread it back into the barrel extension, but you don't want to go all the way down. You want to go until you basically start getting a little bit of resistance right here until it's, you don't want to like completely screw it down because then it'll be really hard to set your head space. It's just about right there. Okay. Then we have the receiver. I will go ahead and again, this is all one long giant unit now. Run it back in through the back of the gun. I have to push on this. This is the little spring-loaded pin, I'm sorry, here, that locks into the recess in the receiver. So I'll push that down with my finger just to let it clear. I've done that, so then I can just push it in the rest of the way. And it'll lock itself in place, you just heard that. So now those, now those components are back inside the firearm. Okay, now I can take my bolt and guide it along those rails inside the barrel extension. Just like that. Now before it goes all the way in, I gotta replace my charging handle. So I will look for that little hole, replace that charging handle, bring it forward and let it lock. Then I can take the back plate. I will start guiding it on there. Go ahead and release that little latch and that drops back down into place. Now the last thing I need to do is release my spring tension. So I will bring the bolt back and hold it. Because remember, once I release this spring, it's gonna wanna, here we go, drop. Now, I am out of headspace, so you don't wanna just let this slam forward. Bring it just like that. Now, the next thing we need to do is set our headspace. So, you will see the barrel is not closed. The, the gap here in the trunnion is not entirely closed. So we are out of headspace. So what I'm going to do, and I, I'm simplifying this for the purposes of this video, is you'll bring the bolt back slightly, turn the barrel one click, like that. And there's a little spring-loaded pin that's corresponding into these little notches. I'll bring this in closer for you. So then once you click it once, you'll drop the bolt, still not closing all the way, bring the bolt back, turn it one more click, okay, close, still not locking, bring the bolt back, turn it one more click, okay, close, okay, now it locked up, that's called zero headspace, now because we are shooting a 30-06, we've got to bring it two more clicks, bring the bolt back. There's one, and right there is two. So now we are head spaced. So you would have to go through that process anytime you switched out the barrel, either from the front on the 1919 A6 or through the back on the A4. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on this. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you have any questions, please let me know by leaving those down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and make sure you turn on the bell notification so you are aware when I am posting new content. And if you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. That does help me out quite a bit. If you want to see photos and stuff of some of the cool World War II type stuff we get in, also go check me out on Instagram at marksman underscore TV. But anyway, guys, I will leave you all with that. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.